Take from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know you that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Let us stand. O oh God in heaven, we come before you now with cups half empty, pleading that you would fill them, with eyes blinded by the world, asking that you would give us sight, with ears benumbed by the cacophonous sounds of confusion in our environment, asking that you will allow us to hear your voice speaking clearly to us. We invoke your presence with us today. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, number 152. Thanks. Uh, tell me the story of Jesus.
you, choir. What a beautiful way to start our service. Welcome to the Vallejo Drive Church. It's a, the week of a new beginning as we welcome our new senior pastor. We're delighted to have you here. If you're looking for a church home, uh, there's a request form in the bulletin. You can let us know. We're always looking for new people to join our family. Just a welcome today to our guest organist and pianist, Mark Hussey. Thank you for being with us today. And a couple of items I need to mention because they're important. Uh, it's now required that all individuals who work with children have to have a background check. We've passed our deadline, so if, if you're working with the children and have not passed the background check, you need to finish that before you can continue working. So please take note of that announcement and, and find out what you need to do. Uh, we're approaching the time of year where we accept applications for student aid for next year at Glendale Academy and Elementary. If you are interested in making an application, you can pick those up at the hostess desk in the foyer. The deadline to turn that in is the end of the month. Well, tomorrow is a very special day. There's a lot of people here who know what day it is. Okay, dads, if you're a dad, stand to your feet. We want to recognize you. Let's give all the dads a big hand. Yeah, our conference president forgot what he's a dad too. <laughs> well, just just a minute, man. I, I want to, you know, every year it's always difficult to know what to do. A gift, you know, sometimes it's a flower, sometimes it's a little uh, bookmark or whatever. Uh, I just couldn't think what to do this year, and then I thought of this saying that we always seem to have in our society. And you can help me finish it. The way to a man's heart is through his. Oh, I'm glad you all agree with me because that's what our plan is today. And it's not just for the dads, but for everybody. We have a big reception afterwards, have a special Father's Day cake, and a whole bunch of goodies for everybody so we can all have a chance to fellowship together, honor the dads, and welcome our new senior pastor right after the service. So, gentlemen, we'll see you there. You can go home with uh, a warm feeling in your heart and your stomach. Thank you. You can be seated. I'd like to welcome our conference president, Valino Salazar, to the pulpit. He is going to introduce our new senior pastor. Happy Sabbath, Vallejo Drive Saints. It is my pleasure to be with you today and being today here at this very special occasion. It has been a long journey searching for the new senior pastor for this congregation. It was over a year. Your pastor search committee has worked so hard and we appreciate the numerous hours that they spend in prayer, in dialogue, in conversations, and seeking God's will. They were looking for the right person to fit within the values and the culture of this congregation. Each church has a unique personality which is important to consider when searching for a pastoral coverage. After, after 22 years that I have been participating in pastoral search processes in many churches, I can see that at one point it seems that the search committee is looking for the perfect pastor. And also, the region and the conference, sometimes we tend to lean on that. And I'm going to share with you what I found in my files about the perfect pastor. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 20 minutes, so you already know. He condemns sin roundly, but never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight, and he's also the church janitor. The perfect pastor makes $100 per week, wears quality clothes, drives a nice car, buys good books, and donates $50 per week. 
per week to the church. The perfect pastor is 29 years old and he has 40 years of experience. <laughs> He's above else, tall and handsome. The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers and he spends most of the time with the senior citizens. He smiles all the time with a very straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his church. This perfect pastor makes 25 phone calls every day to his people and always is in, in his office on hand when needed. The perfect pastor always has time to the church board in all its subcommittees. He never misses a meeting of the conference. And he always is busy evangelizing the unchurched. Obviously, friends, this is something that sometimes we have higher expectations on that. Yes, we have high expectations from pastors. And it's good. Today is a special moment in the history of this church. First, in several areas, today a new chapter has begun in the life and ministry of this church. Today, just as we will do in a marriage ceremony, a special relationship is forged. The pastor commits to certain obligations and responsibilities to the church, and also the congregation agrees to the responsibilities to the new pastor and his family. I read from John 1, 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. This morning, we have before us Pastor James L. Kyle. He has been an ordained minister for many years. I had the opportunity to meet him back in 1983, 84 probably. And we together, we were sat down at the Santa Monica School Board when I was pastoring, I began to pastor. In this, in this conference many years ago. He is a pastor dedicated to ministry. He has kept that called very clear in mind and he received another call. A call to be a physician. He went to medical school. He graduated and he practiced medicine. He has been in administration of uh, uh, healthcare institutions. And during this time, also, he never, he never has sensed that God has removed the first call to ministry. So he, the conference at the time, explored a new possibility to have a bivocational pastor, and he accepted that challenge. At that time, the African American uh, Ministries Department asked him to take a small congregation and help that congregation in any way possible. I can witness. I'm not going to be relying right now in the statistics, but it's pretty much around that congregation when he uh, was assigned to the congregation. Probably the members and the list were about 100, but the attendance was probably 40. And after seven years of ministry in that congregation, the attendance of that church grew to more than 600 people every single week. That congregation became a flagship among the African-American churches in the Southern California Conference. 
thanks to God and thanks to the willingness of Pastor and Dr. James Kyle to be allowed to be used by God. After that, he was asked to go and help in another church. He went on interim basis to Berean Church for a short time, a few months. And then, again, he was invited to go to another church, the Tamarind Avenue Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And again, his ministry flourished once again in that congregation. In 2013, he decided, along with his uh, wife, to accept our invitation. They moved to Arizona. And after the missionary uh, work among the, the, uh, the Navajo uh, community, they decided to return to Southern California, where they have been serving in Huidier in one of the hospitals, institutions there. So today is my privilege to introduce to you your new minister, Elder, Elder James L. Kyle and his wife, Joyce, that I will be asking her to come. I'm sorry, I'm going to embarrass you, yes. I can pay later for this. This is the man invited by the Southern California Conference to the pastoral service process of this church to spiritually guide this congregation. He has happily accepted this new call and together with this church opened a new chapter in the history of this congregation. Therefore, at this time of this pastoral installation, I have a charge for you, but not just for you, also for the congregation. And mine is gonna be simple and brief because I consider that you can give me the charge to me. I'm gonna read 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16. Let no one despise your youth. In this case, it's not applicable. But be example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in the spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which has been given to you by prophecy with the laying with the laying on the on, on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed of yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And to the congregation, I would use 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and the following verses. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for the work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. After reading God's word, I have no more comments, 
and there is no need of explanation at all. Now, I'm going to invite the elders and the associate pastors to come, and we would like to offer a special prayer for this new pastoral team for this congregation. Elder Kyle and his wife right here, and then we, the elders and the pastors, would be surrounding you behind, please. And extend your hands over them. Please come. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, this morning we come before you expressing our gratitude for being a loving and kind Father. Today, during this weekend, we are remembering these early uh, earthly fathers, but we keep in mind our Heavenly Father who watches over us all the time. And Lord, we recognize you as a loving Father, a loving God. And today, Lord, we are becoming before you because a new chapter in the history of this congregation now is opened. And Lord, we are gr grateful, grateful for the previous chapters in the history of this congregation. Each minister who has passed, who has been used by you, has been a blessing to this church. And now, a new one comes. Elder James Kyle has been invited to take the lead of this congregation. Lord, the search committee, along with him, have felt that this is your will. And now we as a congregation, we are here reaffirming this call. And we are praying that your spirit continue manifesting your will in each one, not just in the pastoral staff, not just among the elders, but also among the congregation. That together, Lord, we can be a lighthouse, a beacon, light in this community. Use us to bring glory to you and to benefit your children. Be with also his uh, lovely wife. We thank you for the ministry that along Pastor Kyle, both together, they have provided to your people. And Lord, I also pray for each one of the elders that are surrounding uh, Pastor Kyle at this time, along with the associate pastors. Each one of them is coming from a different background. You have prepared and you have built each one of them with talents and spiritual gifts, and each one is different. Lord, we recognize that the devil, he's a specialist on, uh, on highlighting our differences. But we count on your help. We are sure that your spirit, who always brings unity, will work for the sake of God's church. Be with this new team. Be with this congregation. And when you come, we just want to hear the words of Jesus Christ saying, well done, my children. Come and join me forever. We ask in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a couple items while everyone's going back to their seats. We have a gift of flowers for Mrs. Kyle to carry, and we wish her God's blessing uh, in this time of ministry as well. I want to take a moment to recognize all the folks on the 
uh, search committee. You realize this took a year. And I want you to know that many times we met as often as twice a month. We researched over 40 names in, in, with a lot of work. Wayne, uh, did a, Wayne Smith did a wonderful job of leading. Wayne, would you stand up? We want to thank you for your leadership. All those on the staffing committee, please stand up. Uh, I don't think everybody's standing up. Fred and others who are on the staffing committee, yeah, please stand up so that folks can recognize. They spent hours and hours, Irvin in the back there, and so, uh, there was a lot of work, I'm telling you. You heard what, uh, what the job description was from the president, right? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I want to add one thing. We probably wound up with those 40 names interviewing about six people. But the end of Dr. Kyle's interview, there was one vote beyond that committee, and it was the vote of the Holy Spirit. We all felt it. We all believe that God ordained this call. We pray that each one of you will open your hearts and minds to service in this church, that we can move together and be blessed because God is leading. Okay, boys and girls, it's time to come forward for the children's story. And while they do, moms, dads, grandpas and grandmas, everybody else, stand to your feet, reach out, and welcome somebody to church. Do we have all the boys and girls up here? Wow, we have so many today. We're all overflowing over there. Oh my goodness. Well, it's so nice to see you all this morning. Happy Sabbath. Can you say that a little louder for everybody to hear? Happy Sabbath. Good job. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's a wonderful day today. We're in celebration today because we have a new senior pastor. Tomorrow is a very special day where we get to celebrate our fathers. All right, well today we're going to hear a story about Jesus and when he was calling his disciples. And one of those disciples was named Matthew. Now, can you tell me who uses one of these? Yes. Nurses. Okay, nurses. Who else? Doctors. Doctors. Yes, doctors and nurses use these. What is this called? Can somebody tell me what this is called? Stethoscope. That was very close. No? Stethic. Ste mm, I can't say it. <laughs> Does anybody have it? Stethoscope. Very good. A stethoscope. That's right. It's called a stethoscope. And what do they use this for? Elijah? Hearing people's heartbeat. Yeah, that's right. They listen to your heart. They listen to your lungs. 
They can even listen to your tummy to see if it's doing well, if it's making lots of noises. Is that funny? Okay, so um, doctors are help us to get well, right? When do people usually go to the doctor? Claire? If they're sick. When they're sick, right? Sometimes we go when we're healthy, but we usually go when we're sick. And what do we want the doctor to do for us? Make us better. Yeah, we want the doctor to make us better, right? All right, so Jesus went to Matthew's house, and there were lots of people there, but they weren't the very nice church-going people. They were in open sin. They were doing a lot of things that were not good. But Jesus was still eating with them. And do you know what he said? He said to those people who were asking him, why are you eating with the sinners? You should be eating with the righteous people. If you were really the Messiah, you would be eating with the righteous people, not the sinners. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, I didn't come here for the righteous people. People who go to the hospital are sick. Healthy people don't go to the hospital, just the sick people. So I came for those people who are stuck in sin. And do you know, all of us have a sin problem in our hearts, right? And it's a problem that a doctor can't fix. Not a medical doctor, anyway. Who can fix our broken hearts and our sinful hearts? God. Yes. God. Yeah, right? Jesus can fix our sinful hearts. He died for our sins on the cross. He took all of our sins on himself, and he died for us. I'm so thankful that Jesus did that for us. You guys, today, uh, since the, our, we have our new senior pastor, you guys get to listen to the sermon today with your moms and dads. There's no children's worship today, but we'll start up again next week. All right? Uh, let's say a really quick prayer for you guys, and then you guys can go back to your seats. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us, and thank you for taking care of our sinful nature. Thank you for um, being our doctor who can help us to heal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can go back to your seats. Well, good morning. I was reflecting this past week that I've been here nine months now, and this is the very first time that I've been called upon to call for the tithes and offering. Somehow I thought I would escape, but I was wrong. In fact, I had a conversation with Pastor Luke in the back, and I said, Pastor Luke, can we switch? Let me do the prayer and you do the offering. And he said, no, you don't get to escape this one. And so I guess there's a first time for everything. He said, just call for the tithes and the offerings, the Lord's tithes and the morning's offerings. So at this time, the deacons will come forward. You know, I was reflecting a few years ago when I attended a church worship service. It, it wasn't this church, neither was it a Seventh-day Adventist church. And all of a sudden, while I was in church, I heard a conversation going on between the $20 bills and the $100 bills and the $50 bills and the $10 bills and the $5 bills. 
they were talking about all the exciting things they get to do. They said, we get to go to the party. And another $20 bill said, I get to go shopping. And the $100 bill says, we get to go out to lunch all the time. And the $5 bills and the $10 bills said, we get to go out to the game and we have a lot of fun. And all of a sudden, I heard the quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies in the back corner of somebody's pocket crying. And I wondered, why are they crying? And they said, because all we ever get to do is go to church. <laughs> and so for today, as we call for the Lord's tithes and our free will offering, I want you to know that our offering is for the church budget. And we're calling not just the quarters, the dimes, the nickels, and the pennies, but bless your heart, we're calling the $100 bills, the $50 bills, the $20 bills. We're calling all the bills, all the soft money, away from the parties, away from the shopping, away from the lunch, and we're calling you to come to church. Amen, somebody. And so... As the deacons wait on us for the Lord's tithes and our free will offering, I invite you to dig deep in your pockets. This church budget offering helps to sustain the operation of our church. Our tithe goes to sustain the operation of the ministers and the officials that lead our church, but our offering goes to maintain our building and to maintain all our ministries and to establish this as a community of faith that all of us love to come and fellowship. So dig deep in your pockets and I trust that God will continue to bless you in your life and your ministry. God bless.
Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of giving. We thank you for the gifts that have been given. We, we thank you, O oh Lord, for blessing us so abundantly and giving us the opportunity to give back to you. Bless these funds that have been received today. May they go towards the forwarding of the gospel ministry and towards the advancement of the kingdom of God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Church. Uh, now's the time for our congregational prayer, so I invite those of you who feel like you need a special blessing in your life uh, to come up and join me here at the, uh, at the front. And while you're coming forward, we'll sing our prayer song, hymn number 671.
For those of you who are able, uh, please kneel. Let us pray. Creator God, to you belong the mysteries of the universe. You transform shepherds into kings, the smallest seeds into magnificent trees, and you transformed hardened hearts into loving ones. Lord, bless us with your life-giving spirit, recreate us in your image, and shape us to your purposes. This morning, we confess our sins before you, the acts that we have performed that we shouldn't have, and the acts that we didn't perform but should have. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Father, you have saved us a seat, so may we sit around the table with you as tax collectors and sinners, because we are sick and we are in need of your healing. Lord, we, we thank you for our new senior pastor, we thank you for this pastoral team, and we thank you for the larger team that is this family, Vallejo Drive. Lord, as we move forward, may your spirit give us new and exciting direction, and may we come together like never before as one body with one spirit. We pray these things boldly, assured that your reign of love makes all things new. So plant seeds of confidence and gladness in our hearts so that trusting your word, we may live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Reading from Matthew 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold, behold, need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Good morning, Vallejo Drive. Oh, that's good. Let's practice that one more time. Good morning, Vallejo Drive. You'll hear that from me almost every Sabbath because it's good for us to speak to one another and to welcome another. It also lets me know that you actually have a pulse and you're awake. Those are important things before you start a sermon. As we begin our ministry together, let me first of all say on behalf of my wife and I how thrilled we are to be here as your pastor. We believe that the decision for us to be here was one brought by prayer and fasting, and we accept it as God's call upon our lives, and we look forward to ministering with you together. This church has a marvelous legacy of accomplishment, and while we venerate the past, we must look forward to the future. 
The God of our yesterdays is still the God of our tomorrows. So it's important that we take an opportunity to look ahead and look forward with hope and with optimism. I believe that our best days are still ahead of us, and God invites us to watch him work in our midst. Now, before I begin this morning, I want to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank Mark Papendick for the work he has done as interim pastor in this church and the entire pastoral staff. I also want to thank Fred Klein, our head elder, and the elder board for their ongoing ministry to this church. You know, I was thinking about the pastoral staff, and you have Mark, Luke, Peter, and I'm James. And I thought for a minute, we could call ourselves the disciples, become a grunge band, and go on the road. But I know that Visions of us on the road as a rock band probably will cause you to lose sleep tonight, so forget that I ever said that. I also want to acknowledge my family. You've already met my wife, Joyce, but I have a group of other relatives in the audience. I'd like to have them stand. My oldest son is sitting right here on the aisle. I'm going to ask him to stand. And the rest of my family members, wherever you are, I want to ask you to stand. I got family. These are family, family here. Thank you so much for coming out. One of the secrets to how I grow churches is I just invite my own family members to come in and it allows us to grow. All right. Let's get busy. Lord, we now come before you to open your word. Speak to us. Give us guidance from above is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me first of all comfort you. For those of you who saw my sermon title, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? I just want to make you at ease. I am not talking about me. Gotcha, didn't I? Even just a little bit. We're going to learn that we're talking about a different dinner and a different invitation. Our preaching passage tells the story of an unusual dinner invitation that begins in Matthew chapter 9. And this is an invitation to Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 9, and maybe I should, if I'm going to show you slides, I guess I should change the slide. We find this passage. As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the, tax, at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. This Matthew was a publican. He was indeed a sinner by occupation. He was a tax collector, and the Jews hated tax collectors, but the tax collectors took money on behalf of the Roman Empire, on behalf of the oppressing army, and took it away from people, and they took a profit right off the top. Jesus says to this man, follow me. Jesus went out of his way to find a sinner like Matthew and invite him to be one of the 12. To those watching, Matthew didn't look any different after the call than he did before the call. Spiritual progress and transformation takes time. So he didn't look different, but he was indeed changed from the inside out. Look at verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and with his disciples. Matthew was so grateful This works so much better when it's on, I see, yes. Matthew was so grateful that Jesus had stopped to call him that he decided to throw a big dinner party and invite all of his friends to come and see Jesus. 
And so he's in a home at a table with tax collectors and with sinners. Jesus was the surprise dinner guest. So there are a couple of questions that come up. Jesus loved to hang out with sinners. That's who he was. He left heaven to save a planet full of sinners. He loved to hang out with them. He was comfortable with sinners. But the other question I want to raise, why were sinners so comfortable with him? What was going on with him that allowed sinners to like him so much? Well, I believe it's because Jesus offered unconditional love and acceptance. Jesus, you see, was safe. He was safe to be around, and that's why people love to be with him. He was grace unconditional. That's who Jesus was. He says in John 12, verse 13, 32, he says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples unto myself. He has that ability, both while alive and certainly after he was dead, to draw men and women unto him. But then we get to verse 11. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and with sinners? Now, I have never been in a church as pastor where there was not at least one Pharisee. If you'd like to identify yourself now, you just save us all a lot of trouble. There are always Pharisees amongst the people of God. And these Pharisees were insulted that God would take the opportunity that Jesus would sit with sinners. They couldn't understand, if you're such a righteous man, why are you hanging out with publicans and sinners? But we find in Scripture, from Romans chapter 5, verse 20, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Jesus brings his grace to meet our sin. And no matter how big your sin is, there's still enough grace to take care of it. Somebody ought to say amen. Where would we be if Jesus hated sinners? In fact, the issue for many in the church is that we have come to hate sinners while we love sin. Many of us are what I would call voyeurs. We may not do the sin, but we like to watch the sin, and we approve of those who do. See, there is this concept of salvation by geriatrics. When you get so old, you just you don't have no energy to sin. So you think. But we sin in our minds. We sin in our attitudes. We sin by lacking love for other people. No matter how many chocolates you eat or how much tithe you pay or no matter what your multi-generational Adventist heritage may be, we need to understand that we are all sinners saved by grace. Some of you, I go back all the way to last year college days. God has been grateful to us. He's been merciful to us. I think of all the stupid stuff I did when I was in my 20s. None of you ever did stupid stuff in your 20s. I can tell you're exceedingly wise. But me, on the other hand, I, I did some really dumb things. And as we get to know each other, when I, when I feel it's okay, I'll tell you about some of my, my stupidity. But God, in his mercy, still preserves. He still holds us. He still keeps us. And I'm grateful. How can I look down on the loss without remembering that there but by the grace of God go I? You know, we are like a lifeboat. The church is like a lifeboat. And all around the boat are men and women who are drowning in sin. How could any of us sitting inside the boat not lend a hand to bring somebody in, out of the water, into the boat. See, there are two types of people in the lifeboat. There are those who were born into the lifeboat. 
and there are those who are pulled out of the water into the boat. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the first people who want to jump back in the water are the folk who were born in the boat? Also, sometimes the people born inside the lifeboat think that they have an unusual right to the tree of life, that somehow they are a different set of member than those who were baptized into the church. But there's one thing they forgot. We who were born inside the church, I wasn't one, I was pulled out of the water, but those of you who were born in the church need to remember that you were born wet. You're just as wet as the people you pulled out of the water. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We live in a sinful world, a world of injustice and a world of inhumanity. I don't know if you're aware that here in Los Angeles County, 16% of our county, 1.4 million people live with food insecurity, which means they're not quite sure where their next meal will come from. We've read and seen in the news about border children, children snatched from their parents. Now almost 2,000 of them essentially incarcerated. And I've seen now ministers and churches and others demonstrating about what they feel about this. But you don't have to go to the border to show love for someone right here in Glendale. Before we go much further in this message, I would like to deal with the elephant in the room. I know there's been quite a bit of discussion about who this pastor guy was going to be. So I think I should deal with this once and for all. And although it may appear obvious to most, let me just come out and admit it. I am tall. I feel I'm so glad I got that off my chest. And even though I am tall, and you may be short, I love you with all the love that Christ can give. Because whether we're tall or short, fat or thin, bald or hairy, we are one in Jesus. Look around. A rainbow of men and women of different nationalities, different colors. We are one. And in unity, there is also diversity. And from that diversity, we find strength to move forward. Now that's over, we can move on with the rest of this message. Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. All people. This is the legacy of this church. It's the reality of this church. So we should rejoice in our oneness. Now the Lord impressed me in my prayer about coming here. I said, Lord, what is it you want me to do here? There's a long trail of fine pastors past of this church, distinguished gentlemen. What do you want of me? And as I read and studied, the Lord impressed me with two things. Number one, he said to love you. So like it or not, I'm just going to love you. But the second thing he said, create an environment where my people love one another. I've had several of you tell me and confirm for me that that's exactly what you felt God needed to do in this church. I believe Vallejo Drive should become a citadel of God's love. That this church should be known by all who drive by or hear about it. That if they want to find love, they need to come 300 Vallejo Drive. Do you believe that? You see, Jesus understood that there is no stronger force to attract men and women than the force of love. 
that's how we will win this community. We won't win them by beating them over the head with tracts and, 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 or Bible studies, although the Bible must be studied and must be understood. But how you win men and women is the way that Christ did it, and you do it by loving them. And when you love them, they will wonder, what's different about you? The love that we share with one another is an attractive force like a gravitational singularity. You get so close, you can't escape. And so the church becomes sticky because people come in and they feel so warm when they get there. They don't want to leave. They want to come back for more because people want to be loved. John 13, 35 says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is the identification of the disciples of God. Not how well they can quote scripture, but by how well they love one another. So guess who's coming to dinner? Every sinner we can love. That's who's coming to dinner. Let me just take a minute to tell you what I plan on doing in the next few months. With the, board, with the church board's permission, hopefully in the next 90 days, we are going to stage for leadership, a strategic planning retreat. It may be a day, it may be three days, where we will sit and prayerfully go through God's word to understand what is it that you want us to do moving forward. We need a plan in order to act out what God wants to do. And I think that plan will be based on a passage in Micah that you saw in the newsletter. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. How do we fulfill that commitment in 2018? The humble walk of love. We will study that, and then we will implement how we, in this congregation, will fulfill God's mission for us. Jesus, in response to the Pharisees, said, They that are well need not a physician, but they that are sick. Who are the well? Have we met them? Well, if you understand what the scripture is saying here, the well in this context are self-righteous, deluded people who think they have no need of a savior. Well, who are the sick? All of us. For you see, well ones aren't well at all. But for sick ones like us, there is a remedy and that remedy is Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God is not impressed with our sacrifice. He's not impressed with our prestige and our pretense. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. So what is he impressed with? He is impressed by extending us mercy. See, I used to pray for justice. I wanted God to, to right all the wrongs in my life. Now I just pray for mercy. Mercy for me. Mercy for others. Because you don't want real justice. Because real justice would suggest that not even eat, not even we would be okay because of our sins. So we, we pray for mercy. We love him because he first loved us. Duty, by the way will not save us. We have to serve God, not from a sense of duty, but from a sense of gratitude for what he has done for us. There are some who are so wonderful in their own eyes, so wise in their own minds, they feel no need of contrition or repentance. I had a man once tell me in a Sabbath school class in a church that will remain unnamed for obvious reasons. He said, I haven't sinned in the last six weeks. And I thought to myself, you just sinned by telling that lie. 
Because there's not, not only are there sins that we commit, small s, but there's also the sin that we are, capital S. We are born in sin, shapen in it. Before you ever commit a single act, we still are sinful in our natures. God came to change our nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Christ is in the business of remaking sinners. So in his name this morning, I came to preach Christ and him crucified. I'm calling today for sinners to repent. And I will do that in just a few minutes. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. We'll finish that passage in just a second. Crucified men and women are kind and loving. Crucified men and women. Uh, it went faster than I wanted to go. Let's go back. Crucified men and women are safe. Safe to be around. Safe to hang out with. They don't judge you. They don't treat you badly. They don't speak evil of you, they are saved. This is why people were attracted to Jesus, because Jesus was indeed safe to be around. Crucified saints understand what Romans 8 chapter 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If God doesn't condemn me, why would you? Why would anyone? When we are truly crucified, not only will we love sinners, but sinners will be drawn to us. The only cross that people will see today is the one that you and I climb up on. My question for you, have you climbed up on your cross? The crucified Christ must be crucified in us and we must be crucified in him. Ah, boy, this thing is really sensitive. We'll be in next week's sermon in a minute. Okay, there we go. Christ draws all men unto himself by the personal crucifixions of his people, of his followers. Have you experienced that crucifixion? The rest of that passage in Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ draws us all by his love. There is a monogram cross with your name on it just waiting for you. Hopefully you've already been introduced to it. And you know it well. Matthew 16, 24 says, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. By your membership in this church, you have declared yourself to be a cross bearer. And if you don't bear that cross, if self is not crucified every day, then who are we fooling? What a shame it would be to spend 30 or 40 years come to church every Sabbath, paying tithe every month, not drinking, not smoking, eating vegetarian food and getting constipated. What a shame it would be if after all of that, you left your cross on the ground with the assumption that somehow you're going to see heaven. You know, there are several surprises that happen in heaven. The first surprise is the surprise that you got there. Second surprise is you're surprised that some of the people you thought would never make it are there. The third surprise is that some of the people you thought would make it aren't. Which surprise do you want? 
Well, if you don't get the first surprise, you don't, the other two don't matter. I'm more than willing to be surprised that I make it there. I want to be there. I want to see the Lord in peace. So let me close. You know, one of the things I've learned in my pastoral ministry is that you don't want to be the last thing standing between people and their food. But I haven't rushed today. I wanted to take my time because I realized that there is no children's church today, the children with us. I'm not known for short sermons, so you'll have to pray for me. I'll get better. There's one more dinner party that Jesus wants to attend. And that party is found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. What is fascinating about this passage? Jesus is doing everything he knows how to do to reach us. He stands knocking at the door, but then he says, if anybody hears my voice, which means he didn't say if anybody hears the knock, he said, if you hear my voice, so not only is he standing at the door, he's calling out to his people. But what I find fascinating about this passage, why is Jesus standing outside? This is the Laodicean church. This is the last of the, of the churches mentioned in Revelation. Jesus is not in the church. He's standing on the outside, knocking, trying to get in. Could it be that the so-called people of God have never let him in? And so the prophet John, seeing the church in his last days, is saying to us, you're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, but you don't have Jesus inside. And so he knocks. And so he calls. Let me read a passage to you as I close from Review and Herald, November 2, 1886. With every knock unheeded, our determination to open becomes weaker and weaker. If the voice of Jesus is not heeded at once, it becomes confused in the mind with a multitude of other voices. The world's cares and business engross the attention and conviction dies away. We'll finish it together. The heart becomes less impressible and lapses into perilous unconsciousness of the shortness of time and of the great eternity beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, don't let this happen to you. If you do not heed the call of God, this is our future. So one thing you need to know about me, I'm an old-fashioned preacher. I don't believe that anyone can join the church unless somebody asks them to do so. about what other people think your reputation someone here needs to open the door why y'all looking at me you must be having your heads down praying put your heads down
pray because somebody's soul may be weighing in the balance. If you have heard God speaking to you this morning and you believe that you need that closer walk with Jesus, that you need to open your heart fully, unreservedly, and let him in, that you want him to take full control of your life and save you and your family. That's what I want. If you want that for yourself, would you just stand with me as we pray? I'll wait for you. God bless you. There are others. Lord and Father, we stand not because we have uh, achieved or have ascertained to salvation. We stand recognizing our need for a Savior. Recognizing that we may be in that number of those whose hearts have become unimpressible and that perhaps the nearness of eternity has escaped our minds. Lord, save us. Fill us with your spirit. Seal us in your truth. You promise in John that you hold us in your hand and no one has the power to snatch us out of your hand. Lord, we pray for that in our lives, that that would be our experience. Bless this church. Bless every believer. Before I close a prayer, there may be someone here who wants to be a part of the Vallejo Drive Church. You've been led here not by accident, but by divine appointment. If you sense that that is God's will for your life, just slip your hand into the air that we can identify you and help you. I see a hand right there. I see a hand back there. Brother, my, my pastoral staff, would you see these hands and talk to these men, individuals? Hand right here. Hand there. Are there other hands? You want to be a part of this family? Just raise your hand. I see a hand right over here. God bless you. Just raise them a little higher so I can make sure I don't miss any of you. This won't take but a minute more. Keep those hands up so our elders can find you. Are there others? Praise God. Lord and Father, you have seen these hands. You know their hearts. We thank you for their decisions today. We look forward to the day when Vallejo Drive is packed to capacity with sinners. And you come to dinner with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our closing song. Jesus Paid It All, number 184.
thank you for your presence in our midst today. We thank you for this beginning. May your spirit never depart from us. May our ears and eyes be open to your leadership and guidance. May our hearts be softened by the power of your love. Go with us now as we end this service. Be with us throughout this week. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I hope that you will stay by. I, I, I think I'm supposed to go out there and shake hands out, out front. No one, no one told me we're out there. Okay. And, but after that, we're going to have a reception on the patio. Um, men, there's a lot of great food and, and treats for men, but there's also food for women and children. So we'll have a good time. God bless you. Thank you.